Ah, how oft we read or hear of boys we almost stand in fear of. For example, take these stories of two youths named Max and Morris, who, instead of early turning their young minds to useful learning, often leered with horrid features at their lessons and their teachers. Look now at the empty head he is for mischief always ready, teasing creatures climbing fences, stealing apples, pears and quinches, is of course a deal more pleasant and far easier for the present than to sit in schools or churches fixed like roosters on their perches. But oh dear, oh dear, oh dearie, when the end comes sad and dreary, tis a dreadful thing to tell what on Max and Morris fell. All they did this book rehearses, both in pictures and in verses. Trick first. To most people who have leisure, raising poultry gives great pleasure. First, because the ex us, for the care we take repay us. Secondly, that now and then we can dine on roasted hen. Thirdly, of the hens and gooses, feathers men make various uses. Some folks like to rest their heads in the night on feather beds. One of these was Widow Tibbets, whom the cut you see exhibits. Hence were hers in number three and a cock of majesty. Max and Morris took a view, fell to thinking what to do. One, two, three, as soon as said, they have sliced a loaf of bread, cut each piece again in four, each a finger thick, no more. These to two cross threads they tie, like a letter X they lie, in the widow's yard with care, stretched by those two rascals there. Scarce the cock has seen the sight, when he up and crew with might. Cock a doodle doodle do! Tuck, 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 the trio flew. Cock and hens, like fowls unfed, gobbled each a piece of bread. But they found, on taking thought, each of them was badly caught. Every way they pull and twitch, this strange cat's cradle to unhitch. Up into the air they fly, chimney, oh Jiminy! On a tree, behold them dangling, in the agony of strangling. And their necks grew long and longer, and their groans grew strong and stronger. Each lays quickly one egg more, then they cross to the other shore. Widow Tibbets in her chamber, by these death cries wakes from slumber. Rushes out with boatful thought, heavens, what sight her vision caught! From her eyes the tears are streaming. Oh, my cares, my toil, my dreaming! Ah, life's fairest hope, says she, hangs upon that apple tree. Heartsick, you may well suppose, for the carving knife she goes. Cuts the bodies from the bough, hanging cold and lifeless now. And in silence, bathed in tears, through her house door disappears. This was the bad boy's first trick but the second follows quick. Trick second. When the worthy widow Tibbets, whom the cut below exhibits, had recovered on the morrow from the dreadful shock of sorrow, she, as soon as grief would let her think, began to think to her better, just to take the dead, the dear ones, who in life were walking here once, and in a still noonday hour, them well roasted to devour. True, it did seem almost wicked when they lay so bare and naked, picked and singed before the blaze, they that once in happier days in the yard or garden ground all day long went scratching round. Ah, Frau Tibbets wept anew, and poor Spitz was with her too. Max and Morris smell the savor, climb the roof, cried each young shaver. Through the chimney now, with pleasure, they behold the tempting treasure. Headless, in the pen there, lying, hissing, browning, steaming, frying. At that moment, down the cellar, 
Dreaming not what soon befell her, Widow Tibbets went for sour, Crowd which she would oft devour, With exceeding great desire, Warmed a little at the fire. Up there on the roof, meanwhile, They are doing things in style. Max already with forethought, A long fishing line has brought. Schnuppdiwupp, there goes O Jiminy, One hand dangling up the chimney. Schnuppdiwupp, a second bird. Schnuppdiwupp, up comes the third. Presto, number four they haul. Schnuppdiwupp, we have them all. Spitz looks on, we must allow, but he barks, rawow, wow, rawow. Wow. But the rogues are down in stanter, from the roof and off they canter. Ha, <laughs> I guess there'll be a humming. Here's the widow Tibbets coming. Rooted stood she to the spot, when the pen her vision caught. Gone was every blessed bird. Horrid Spitz was her first word. Oh, you Spitz, you monster, you. Let me beat him black and blue. And the heavy little thwack comes down on poor Spitz's back. Loud he yells with agony, for he feels his conscience free. Max and Morris, dinner over, in a hedge snort under cover. And of that great hand feast now, each has but a leg to show. This was now the second trick, but the third will follow quick. Trick third. Through the town and country round was one Mr. Buck renowned. Sunday coats and weekday sack coats, bobtails, swallowtails and frock coats, gaiters, breeches, hunting jackets, waistcoats with commodious pockets, and other things too long to mention, claimed Mr. Taylor Buck's attention. Or if anything wanted doing, in the way of darning, sewing, piecing, patching, if a button needed to be fixed or put on, anything of any kind, anywhere before, behind, Master Buck could do the same, for it was his life's great aim. Therefore, all the population held him high in estimation. Max and Morris tried to invent ways to plague this worthy gent. Right before the Sartre's dwelling ran a swift stream roaring, swelling. This swift stream abridged its span, and the road across it ran. Max and Morris, naught could awe them, took a saw when no one saw them. Ritze, ratze, riddle, diddle, sought a gap into the middle. When this feat was finished well, suddenly was heard a yell. Hello there, come out, you buck! Taylor, Taylor, muck, muck, muck! Buck could bear all sorts of jeering, jibes and jokes in silence hearing. But this insult roused his anger. Nature couldn't stand it longer. Wild with fury, up he started. With his yardstick out he darted. For once more that frightful jeer, muck, 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 rang loud and clear. On the bridge one leap he makes, crash, beneath his weight it breaks. Once more rings the cry, muck, muck, in, head foremost, plumps poor Buck. While the scared boys were skedaddling, down the brook two geese came paddling. On the legs of these two geese, with a death clutch, Buck did seize, and with both geese well in hand, flutters out upon dry land. For the rest he did not find things exactly to his mind. Soon it proved poor Buck had brought a dreadful bellyache from the water. Noble Mrs. Buck she rises, fully equal to the crisis. With a hot flat iron she draws the cold out famously. Soon twas in the mouths of men, all through town, Buck's up again. This was the bad boy's third trick, but the fourth will follow quick. Trick fourth. An old saw runs somewhat so, man must learn while here below. Not alone the ABC raises man in dignity, not alone in reading, writing, reason finds a work inviting. Not alone to solve the double rule of three shall man take trouble, but must here with pleasure sages teach the wisdom of the ages. Of this wisdom an example to the world was Master Lempel. For this cause, to Max and Morris, this man was the chief of horrors. For a boy who loves bad tricks, 
wisdom's friendship never seeks. With the clerical profession, smoking always was a passion, and this habit, without question, while it helps promote digestion, is a comfort no one can well begrudge a good old man when the day's vexations close and he sits to seek repose. Max and Morris, flinty-hearted, on another trick have started, thinking how they may attack a poor old man through his tobacco. Once, when Sunday morning breaking, pious hearts to gladness waking, poured its light where in the temple, at his organ sate Herr Lempel. These bad boys for mischief ruddy, stole into the good man's study, where his darling Meerschaum stands, this Max holds in both his hands. While young Morris, scapegrace born, climbs and gets the powder horn. And with speed the wicked soul pours the powder in the bowl. Hush and quick, now right about, for already church is out. Lempel closes the church door, glad to seek his home once more. All his service went well through, takes his keys and music too, and his way delighted went homeward to his silent friends. Full of gratitude he there lights his pipe and takes his chair. Ah, he says, no joy is found like contentment on earth's round. Fizz, whiz, bam, the pipe is bust, almost shattered into dust. Coffee pot and water jug, snuff box, inkstand, tumbler, muck, table, stove and easy chair, all are flying through the air in a lightning powder flash with a most tremendous crash. When the smoke cloud lifts and clears, Lempel on his back appears. God be praised, still breathing there, only somewhat worse for wear. Nose, hands, eyebrows, once like yours, are now black as any more's. Burned the last tin spare of hair, and his pate is wholly bare. Who shall now the children guide, lead their steps to wisdom's side? Who shall now for Master Lempel lead the service in the temple? Now that this old pipe is out, scattered, smashed, gone up in spout. Time will heal the rest once more, but the pipe's best days are o'er. This was the bad boy's fourth trick, but the fifth will follow quick. Trick fifth. If in village or in town you've an uncle settled down, always treat him courteously. Uncle will be pleased there be. In the morning, morning to you. Any errand I can do you? Fetch whatever he may need, pipe to smoke and news to read. Or should some confounded thing prick his back or bite or sting, nephew then will be nearby, ready to his help to fly. Or a pinch of snuff maybe sets him sneezing violently. Posit, uncle, good health to you. God be praised, much good may do you. Or he comes home late perchance. Pull his boots off then at once. Fetch his slippers and his cap. And warm gown his limbs to wrap. Be your constant care, good boy. What shall give your uncle joy? Max and Morris, need I mention, had not any such intention. See now how they tried their wits, these bad boys on Uncle Fritz. What kind of a bird a may, buck was they knew, I dare say. In the tree they may be found, flying, crawling, wiggling round. Max and Morris, great pains taking, from a tree these bucks are shaking. In their cornucopia papers, they collect these pinching creepers. Soon they are deposited in the foot of uncle's bed. With his peaked nightcap on, uncle Fritz to bed has gone. Tucks the clothes in, shuts his eyes, and in sweetest slumber lies. Kritze, kratze, come the Tartars, single file from their night quarters. And the captain boldly goes straight at uncle Fritzy's nose. Bah! he cries, what have we here? Seizing that grim grenadier, Uncle, wild with fright, upspringeth, and the bedclothes from him flingeth. Ouch! He seizes two more scape, graces from his chin and nape. Crawling, flying to and fro, round the buzzing rascals go. Wild with fury, Uncle Fritz stamps and slashes them to bits. Oh, be joyful, all gone be, 
is the Maybach's devil tree. Uncle Fritz, his eyes came close, once again in sweet repose. This was the bad boy's fifth trick, but the sixth will follow quick. Trick sixth. Easter days have come again, when the pious baker men bake all sorts of sugar things, plum cakes, ginger cakes and rings. Max and Morris felt an ache in their sweet tooth for some cake. But the baker thoughtfully locks the shop and takes the key. Who would steal then? This must do. Wriggle down the chimney flue. Ratsch! Down comes the boys, my chimney. Black as ravens down the chimney. Puff! Into a chest they drop. Full of flour up to the top. Out they crawl from under cover, just as white as chalk all over. But the cracknels, precious treasure, on a shelf they spy with pleasure. Knacks! The chair breaks. Down they go. Schwab! Into a trout of dough. All enveloped now in dough. See them. Monuments of woe. In the baker comes and snickers when he sees the sugar liquors. One, two, three, the breads behold, in two, two good, broads are rolled. There's the oven, all red hot, shove em in as quick as thought. Ruff, out with them from the heat, they are brown and good to eat. Now you think they've paid the debt. No, my friend, they're living yet. Knusper, knasper, like two mice, through their roofs they gnaw in a trice. And the baker cries, you bet, there's the rascals living yet. This was the bad boy's sixth trick, but the last will follow quick. Last trick. Max and Morris, I grow sick when I think on your last trick. Why must these two scalawags cut those gashes in the bags? See, the farmer on his back carries corn off in a sack. Scarce has he began to travel, when the corn runs out like gravel. All at once he stops and cries, Darn it, I see where it lies. Ha! With what delighted eyes, Max and Morris he espies. Rubs! He opens wide his sack, shoves the rogues in huck a -peck. It grows warm for Max and Morris, for to mill the farmer hurries. Master Miller, hello man, grind me that as quick as you can. In with them, each wretched flopper headlong goes into the hopper. As the farmer turns his back, he hears the mill go creaky cracky. Here you see the bits post mortem, just as fate was pleased to sort them. Master Miller stuck with speed, gobbled up the coarse grained feet. Conclusion In the village, not a word. Not a sign of grief was heard. Widow Tibbets, speaking low, said, I thought it would be so. None but self, cried Buck, to blame. Mischief is not life's true aim. Then, said gravely teacher Lempel, this again is an example. To be sure, bad things for youth, said the baker, a sweet tooth. Even uncle says, good folks, see what comes of stupid jokes. But the honest farmer, guy, what concern is that to I? Through the place, in short, there went one white murmur of content. God be praised, the town is free from this great rascality.